I've talked a lot about the evolution of incomes in the long run in the chapter on the stylized facts of economic growth. And in this chapter, I would like to focus on technological progress and living standards more broadly defined, for example, in terms of life expectancy, education, democratization, and pollution. The sources to recommend and on which um, most of the presentation here is based is the website Our World in Data, the website Gapminder, for both you have the links here, and the books by Hans Rosling, Anna rosling Rönlund, Ola Rosling, Factfulness, 10 Reasons We Are Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think, and by Noah Berg, Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. The first figure here shows life expectancy at birth across many different regions in the world from 1770 straight to 2021. Life expectancy at birth is a really important indicator for well-being broad, more broadly defined because health and life expectancy is actually one of the main things we tend to be concerned with. And oftentimes this is just felt in the absence of health, basically, how important it is. The crucial thing here is that we see that in 1770, life expectancy was really low. So in some of these regions, way below 30 years, and in uh, Europe, for example, uh, 35 years, approximately 35 years. So it was at most um, between 30 and 40 years at that time. Now, one of the main reasons why life expectancy was so low at that time was the high child mortality rate, because almost every second child died before the age um, of five. And of course, that has a huge uh, effect on average life expectancy. Then, with economic growth, with increases in income, with technological progress, with uh, increasing standards in hygiene, um, life expectancy started to increase, child mortality started to decrease uh, quite strongly, and fortunately nowadays child mortality is much less of a problem than it was um, uh, a few hundred years ago, basically. And we see nowadays many of the regions achieve life expectancy at birth way above uh, 70 years, also, the world average is above 70 years, and some countries have even have surpassed 80 years, such as Italy, uh, Japan, and so on. What we see at the end is kind of a, a short decrease, which is mainly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the bottom line to take away here is that not only incomes have increased, as we've already seen in the chapter on stylized facts of economic growth, since the Industrial Revolution, but also life expectancy, and actually tremendously so. So even from a broader perspective of well-being, we have seen huge increases since then. Now, what about poverty? If we follow the news, then we would be very much inclined to think that poverty worldwide is on the rise. We see all these terrible pictures. And uh, fortunately, in reality, this is not the case, at least not in the last uh, few decades. And this is reflected here in this figure that shows the world population from 1820 to 2015, which increased from about 1 billion people to more than 7 billion people. And now uh, there is a distinction between those who live in extreme poverty, that's the red area here, and these are people having to live from less than 1.90 international dollars per day, and the red share here, that's the number of people uh, that do not live in extreme poverty. And what we see here is that until the 1960s, 1970s, um, the number of people living in ex extreme poverty increased a little bit less so than the total increase of the population. But since then, the number of people living in extreme poverty has actually gone down quite tr drastically, while the number of people in the world has increased um, strongly from about uh, two and a half billion in 1950 to more than seven billion today. And that implies that the share of the population living in poverty, which is on the next uh, slide here. So here we have the share of the population worldwide living in extreme poverty, this blue area. And this is the share of people not living in extreme poverty. So the share of people living in extreme poverty has declined tremendously and is um, only slightly higher than 10% in 2018. And almost 90% of the population does not have to live in extreme poverty. So this is a huge achievement that we were able to see in the last couple of decades. 
and it's mainly due to economic growth in poor and populous countries such as India and China over that time period, which was able to lift many, many people out of poverty, actually. And this is really a huge accomplishment that um, should uh, be credited as such. The next figure shifts attention towards education, basically, and the literacy rate. And what we see here is that uh, in 1800, uh, almost 90% of the population could not read and write. And then uh, over time, this first decreased only sluggishly, but then since the beginning of the 20th century, there has been a huge drop. And then in 2016, we um, have uh, a rate of um, illiteracy, basically, that is um, a bit more than uh, 10%, but almost 90% of the population now can read and write. And this is also a huge achievement from a historical perspective. So also with respect to education, we have seen quite a lot of progress as we've seen in health with increasing life, increasing life expectancy and with poverty reduction. Often we are confronted with arguments like, yeah, we may have seen increases in income, we may have seen increases in health, life expectancy, education and so on, but actually our life is much more stressful than it was in earlier times because we have to work so much, we don't have time for family, for relatives, for hobbies, for friends. But actually if you look at the data, then we see that this is also not really true over time. We have also been able to increase the time that we do not need to spend at work. So this here is again taken from the website Our World in Data and shows the annual average working hours per worker in different countries. And what we see is that in most of them, the average number of hours worked per year was around 3,000 in 1870. And it has decreased to about... Um, 1,500 to 1,800 uh, in all of them, which means that it almost halved. So in terms of time that we need to spend working, uh, we spent uh, almost um, half as much time at work and therefore have more time available for other activities. Of course, it may be the case that due to the fact that there are so many uh, different opportunities of what we, on what we can spend time today, that life feels more stressful, but at least um, it's not the case that we need to work more on average. So that's not um, what we would see in the data. Another very important aspect is freedom and participation in the political process, actually. And there is another graph from uh, the website Our World in Data that I want to present here, which is the number of people living in democracies versus non-democracies. And it starts again uh, at the beginning of the 19th century here, 1816, and goes up to 2015, uh, where we have again the world population here from 1 billion to more than 7 billion today. And now... Uh, the share of um, the population that lives in democracies, anocracies, and um, basically other um, uh, countries such as uh, colonies or where no data is available, that's uh, displayed here in different colors. Green is democracy, and we see at the beginning of the 19th century virtually nobody in the world lived in a democracy. Almost everybody lived in an uh, anocracy, and basically at that time in absolutist monarchies um, or dictatorships, basically. Um, and then over the uh, 19th century, slowly but steadily, the number of people living in democracies started to increase, but it was very slowly and only since the first and the second world war, the number of people living in democracies and so also the share of people living in democracies really increased uh, tremendously to about 4 billion people, which is um, more than half of the population at that time in 2015. And of course, also that has huge well-being implications. Uh, and I would say that's one of the most important um, aspects in history that so many people nowadays are able to express their thoughts in a democracy, basically, as compared to historical times when this was not the case. <laughs> 
up to now, we looked a lot at different aspects of well-being, such as political participation, freedom of uh, expression, or living in democracies, basically, um, health, education, income, poverty reduction. And now I'd like to focus a little bit more on technological change and how technological change actually impacts our living standards in general. And one fascinating graph in this context, I think, is the price of lighting here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it um, shows the price of lighting in the UK from uh, 1301 to 2006, uh, where the price is per million lumen hours and expressed in British pound. And what we see here is that this price has historically been very high at 35,000 pounds. And that was basically a time when the only source of lighting was actually a fire. Then um, over time, with the advent of um, whale oil and, and, and so on, the price of lighting decreased quite strongly over time. Then there was kind of a sluggish period, uh, but then in the, with... Um, um, kind of oil uh, lamps and electricity and so on, the price of lighting actually decreased to virtually nothing. Nowadays, if we switch on the light or um, any electric devices, most of the people are not really concerned about the price of electricity in this context. But historically, that would actually pre have prevented most parts of the population, almost everybody, from using light as such in the Middle Ages. So that's really um, due to technological progress that we've observed over that time that light lighting became available for um, virtually everybody in the population. Now going a little bit more to modern technologies and modern times, this figure here shows the historical cost of computer memory and storage from the 1950s to 2020. And what we see here is uh, first the price of memory from $100 million per megabyte. It decreased from the 1950s to 2020 to less than 10 cents per megabyte. And with respect to um, disk capacity, it was from $10,000 to less than a tenth of a cent nowadays uh, per megabyte. So this is a kind of re even reinforced by the fact that we have a logarithmic scale here. So we see a huge decrease actually in the cost of memory and storage. And that's something that we can even feel in our everyday lives. So even within one generation, uh, storage capacity just um, the decreased in price uh, tremendously. What I also find a remarkable achievement is the decrease in the price of lithium-ion batteries since 1992, where actually the uh, price was $5,000 per kilowatt hour storage capacity. And then uh, first it decreased only uh, a little bit, but then in the late 1990s it decreased tremendously, and nowadays it's um, about $244 per um, kilowatt hour in a storage capacity. And of course, that's very important for the whole green transition, uh, battery use in uh, electric cars and so on and so forth. And um, this decrease is really um, incredible over this short time period. Now, a little bit of different perspective is actually not so much the introduction of new technologies and their price, but actually whether they are adopted by households. And here you see um, selected technologies and the share of US households that use them actually from 1908 to 2016. Here we see the first one is um, electricity. And the, at the beginning of the 20th century, only about 10% of the population in the U.S. had access to electricity. And then this increased uh, over time, and um, after the Second World War, basically everybody had access to electricity. But nevertheless, this shows that there is actually a huge amount of time that goes by until a really large share of the population uses new technologies, or that uh, there is really quite a long time until technologies diffuse to the wide uh, parts of the population. This line here is the use of cars. Also, this was 
rather low at the beginning of the 20th century, and then it increased. During the wars, it did not increase that much, and then it afterwards in the 60s and 70s, it increased further, and then about 90% of the population nowadays uses cars. Very fast adoption was seen by the um, refrigerator. So um, at the beginning, yeah, um, nobody used it, but increase was tremendously uh, fast. And then um, already in the 1950s, basically almost every household had a refrigerator. Color TV, the increase was also very fast. And in the 1980s, almost everybody had one. And then later the computer also saw a very steep increase in its use. I've introduced another slide here that I find quite illuminating. And that's basically the relative price changes of consumer goods and services in the United States from 1997 onwards to 2017, where the price was normalized actually for all of these consumer goods and services in the year 1997. So if this increased, that means the, the relative price of this particular good or service has increased. And if it went down, it has decreased. What we see actually is that many uh, things that involve electronics actually has decreased quite strongly. So TVs, for example, there was a huge decrease until 2017, also software and toys. So that has actually decreased, uh, particularly here in, uh, in the price and particularly relative to the other uh, goods here. New cars and clothing has actually seen no increase or decrease um, over time. And then there are some items that have seen huge increases. And this, and that I find quite, illustrate, uh, quite, quite, quite illuminating, are those items that involve a lot of human labor. So, for example, child care, education, medical care, they increased quite strongly. College tuition fees, particularly, which is also quite a lot tied to human labor. And then there are some other items such as housing, household energy, um, they are more. They are not so not so closely tied to to human labor input as the other uh, ones here, but also are tied to scarcity. For example, housing in terms of the space that you need for that, and of course also where there is a restricted space. Also, these uh, things increased. Uh, the, the price increased. Now, what we see here also is that actually the price of housing uh, increased strongly, but much less so than uh, education or medical care, which I find very interesting. So this should give a perspective on the relative changes of the prices of certain goods and services over time. And now we come, after having seen this kind of more positive uh, aspects uh, of technological progress and price changes, we come to one challenge that still remains to be solved. It's an unsolved challenge that despite all the increases in um, uh, aspects that are related to well-being, despite the increases in incomes, that we still have no solution for. And this is climate change and emissions. Here we have the CO2 emissions per world region. Starting in 1750, there were almost there were no CO2 emissions basically, and then it started to increase after the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then uh, in the last century, of course, we have seen huge increases to above 35 billion uh, tons um, uh, throughout the world. And we see the shares of the different regions. So of, of, of course, first um, the share of the United States and of Europe was uh, dominant here. Then their shares did not increase that much anymore. Uh, some even went uh, down a bit, such as Europe excluding the U27, uh, so basically the um, European Union. So that went down because of the collapse of uh, industry in Eastern Europe. But we've seen at the same time a huge increase in Asia, China, India uh, in terms of uh, emissions. And of course, that's all together with the huge emissions that we see here, uh, a problem because it leads to uh, climate uh, change and one of the issues that we still need to solve and for which there is not yet a technological solution. And also finding uh, political solutions or behavioral changes in people seems to be very, very difficult that um, could help us to uh, tackle this problem. One crucial question in this context is whether we can achieve something similar with CO2 emissions 
as we have achieved with sulfur dioxide emissions. So here we see sulfur dioxide emissions from 1850 onwards to 2010. And what we observe here is a huge increase until the 1970s, um, beginning 1980s, but then a strong decrease actually. In the 1970s and 1980s, there was a lot um, of talk about acid rain and dying trees actually due to um, acid rain, which was um, kind of caused by uh, sulfur dioxide emissions. But then the, um, the predictions uh, back then did not come to pass because we managed worldwide to decrease uh, sulfur dioxide emissions quite tremendously, particularly in areas such as um, Europe, and also North uh, America. Now, the reason, of course, for that is that we have certain end of pipe technologies, filters with which we can uh, filter out sulfur dioxide that's not available as a technology for CO2 emissions. But nevertheless, there are some signs in some countries that uh, emissions start to decline, even though these countries still experience economic growth. So CO2 emissions started to decline in some countries, although these countries still experience economic growth, and that would be uh, what is needed to fight climate change, or the first thing, a necessary condition, actually, that we have something like an absolute decoupling of emissions from economic growth. Here with sulfur dioxide emissions, we were arguably quite successful at the world level, um, uh, but uh, it remains to be seen whether we will also be successful with respect to CO2 emissions. To illustrate the powers and the pitfalls of technological progress, I actually find one story or forecast actually quite illuminating. And the forecast is like this, that if traffic increases the same way as it did in the past 50 years, then cities like New York and London would face environmental collapse in a literal sense. The reason is that they would drown in horse manure and the prediction is from the 19th century, where basically people uh, thought on this prediction said that in the mid of the 20th century, actually, there would be so many horses that the cities would be literally drown in horse manure. And I mean, despite this outlook, what we obviously see is that these cities survived in the 20th century without being drowned in horse manure. And the reason is actually technological progress. Ironically, the internal combustion engine that is causing the problems now with CO2 emissions solved this particular environmental problem. But now it remains to us to solve the problems that are caused by the internal combustion engine. And this somehow illustrates nicely that technological progress can be a solution, but also the cause of problems later on. So to summarize, in this chapter, we've seen that many problems have been solved in the past by technological progress, by technological change. And we enjoy living standards today that even an emperor or a king or whatever could not have even dreamed of just two centuries ago. For example, we have um, electrical light, we, we can travel around the world, uh, we live much longer on average, we don't have these high uh, infant mortality rates. If we have an, a surgery, for example, due to the appendix, then this was often a death sentence just 100 or 200 years ago, and it is not nowadays. We have anesthesia uh, and so on and so forth. And arguably, the average person living today would not really want to change with an emperor or king living 200 years ago. So technological progress actually really brought uh, huge changes in terms of living standards and increased incomes and so on and so forth. So it often solved problems. However, it often also led to new ones. And uh, what we will talk about also in other chapters here is what economists can do, what can economics actually contribute to be of any help in this context, in the environmental, technological um, context and uh, in the improvement of our living standards. One aspect, for example, particularly with climate change, could be taxation, taxing those um, yeah, activities or resource uses that lead to the problems uh, that we observe. And that's what I want to provide in other chapters and I want to discuss the models that we use in order to analyze these issues.